Board games, board games, we might be talking about the time taking making board games, but we're not gonna shout. How long, how long, I ask how long does it take? We'll discuss after this song. Well, I guess it relies on a variety of things. Maybe you're trying to really give your game some wings. Or maybe you're just trying to get something out there as fast as you can. Either way is good. I'm not going to ban you from the thing. It's not as if I even have that authority. Board games, board games. Let's get on with Fabrizio Leotti. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good whatever it is, wherever you are. 10 a.m. is UK time, time for Bezzy Beats and Board Game Blether. And today... I thought we would chat a little bit because you've been working on this game. Fabrizio, thank you for joining me. You've been working on a game since 2018, fairly full time, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Thanks for having me again, Bez. It's always a pleasure to be here. It's always nice to see and talk to you. It, really it cool. is an absolute delight, and thank you for coming along. Um, how are you today? I'm good. I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. I'm. Uh, a bit anxious about my uh, soon soon to come uh, Kickstarter campaign, but I guess this is just normal anxiety about that. So let's see. So just for the record, this is launching in two days' time. So today we're recording this, and if you're watching this live, then you're it's Tuesday. I mean, yeah, I mean you might be living in the past, you might be living on the other side of the world where it's 10 p.m. at night. I don't know. For you, it might be Monday. But either way, you are going to be launching this Kickstarter in exactly, roughly, 47 hours. Yes, that's it. The big time has come. <laughs> and how are you feeling about this? No, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm much better. You know, this is a relaunch. We launched the Hyper Wars first time last year. And uh, I'm feeling much better about this uh, this year. I feel much more prepared. I think the... Um, I, I think we are we are ready for, for for this. I'd actually like to ask you a little bit about what you've been doing and what the last couple of days have been like for you gearing up to this relaunch. Let's talk a little bit about recent highlights, recent highlights, living life and seeing the sights, recent highlights, recent highlights, playing games and other delights. Recent highlights, what have you been up to? Have you been focusing just on this or is everything done at this point and you're Early comfortable, you're just like, okay, what's done is done. Nice. So, uh, as you know, that all this journey into Kickstarter, uh, like, made me learn so many things, so many things. And the the latest one that I'm learning more is on the video editing, because I'm I'm doing my own video for this campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I did the last one as well, but I had uh, like more. Uh, help from uh, outside in terms of imagery and stuff like this but this time i'm i'm kind of like doing just me and one one friend so we are doing this uh, together and uh, yeah so that's what i've been doing the last past two days i've been working and with, this um... is the second kickstarter you've launched so this project was your first basically so you launched it it didn't quite work out you've come back to the and um, to use the baseball analogy, you've come to give it another swing. And yeah, hopefully you won't get to the third swing, but they say three strikes and you're out, which kind of suggests that, hey, hopefully it won't get that far, but what have you changed? Beats, yeah, you talked about video editing, better presentation. What else? Let's talk, let's talk specifics. Yeah, so uh, it was indeed uh, the second run for this uh, board game. The first one didn't go quite well, sure. But then, the, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's been quite a journey since we we stopped the, the previous campaign. Yeah, that's the new page. Um, we have changed so many things in the game now. So uh, not the game itself, like regarding rules and something, this has nothing to change anymore. The game is ready for production. 
uh, in terms of rules and uh, how it works. But we have revamped a lot of components of the game. So previously, the, the game didn't have the same, um, I mean, the general graphics of the game. They didn't have the, the same cyberpunk vibe that I, that I had from the art of the game. So I, I revamped all that. So before we had like, uh, like you're showing the screen right now, we had like those small uh, plastic cubes uh, representing our, our resources. And now they are actually model boxes. So they are actual crates uh, okay, that we have wow. modeled. Yeah, it's uh, really cool. They are, of course, very small still. Uh, so you can handle the game and so on. And the meeples, they were just regular Carcassonne meeples. But now, no, now they are like very nice. Maybe I can show you one here. So they are very nice uh, plastic meeples, different from everything I have ever seen like this. Yeah, that is really cool. How do they stand? I mean, do they still stand up fairly comfortably, if you know? Yes, it stands up very nicely, like this. Let's see, oops, <laughs> like this. <laughs> but then I... what I think is gr great about them is that uh, with this like big round head they have, it's very easy to get them super fast in the game and then move them around. So mm -hmm. this actually You've has- You've got something to actually the... grab onto, that's cool. Um, yeah, exactly. I I do slightly wonder because now you're introducing more plastic and everything into the game. Um, so all these components are now plastic injection molded, they, I assume? They, they were plastic already. That didn't change actually, but mm. uh, it's just the different types of components. So this one I mean, is a very special component. I, I don't have to do the, the mold for those because the, the manufacturer already produced them. Um, but the boxes, they are completely new. We had to design it from scratch. And of course, we're going to have a mold for this during the production and so on. So, And yeah, as an aside, um, are you doing anything to offset the um, global environmental impacts of this plastic being used? Have you considered yeah. maybe putting money into um, planting trees or doing something to yeah make sure that it's not a carbon positive game yeah that's a very interesting uh, question actually the manufacturer i'm working on uh, they also do that they, they produce plastic of course but they try as much as possible to reduce the the consumption of not only the production of those uh, gases and this carbon footprint but also reduce the consumption of water in the process of doing all this so um, this is something i'm uh, i'm aware of and i understand that like having plastic is maybe not uh, optimal nowadays it was just that with all the the i thought about having this i think the wooden. issue is with the mining of the oil fundamentally that's the yeah issue sure with the plastics sure. but in the case of uh, hyper wars i also think that uh, wooden didn't give the the mm -hmm. right feeling I, I wanted for the, the game. Like from the cyberpunk futuristic point of view, this was uh, harder to achieve with wood. I, I tried this at first, but it wasn't like convey, conveying the, the, the feeling I, I wanted for the game. First. Like, I don't want you to feel like you're on trial. You don't have to answer right now, but I no, want no, no. to it's put the um, idea into your head to follow what was done on Earth Rising, which is a brilliant idea, where they said, you know what, every game does have some impact, Let's actually work out how much carbon impact this has. And I think it would be great to talk for you if you are able to. I mean, I don't want to volunteer their time, but if we and Laurie are able to chat, then oh, there yes. is a certain amount that you can pay. And it's surprisingly not that much just to make mm -hmm. sure that in the production, because sure, you can reduce the water and everything being used and electricity, but it's there is still impacts from the plastics but then what you can do to actually offset that by planting trees or doing other proper carbon sinks that will hopefully stay there for a while i just think no, that, that makes that makes total sense actually yeah and of course i i, I definitely can talk with this about, about this with laurie laurie is a is a great person i, I really like him yeah so you're already in touch great yes um, yes now talking we were talking about recent highlights and what we've been up to um 
I have myself just come back from KCON, which was an absolute delight, hosted by Kel Eckley, a relatively small convention, just under 300 people um, in a hotel. I think that it's really nice when you've got conventions that are on site, because then you can play until one in the morning. And like, look, UK Games Expo, for those few individuals who will be staying in the Hilton, you can do that. Play until like one in the morning, go to bed and come out. But like most people aren't going to do that. That's not what. And so you've got so many different experiences. Whereas a smaller convention, it also has the advantage of, well, hey, I saw your face earlier and I'll see your face the next day and maybe the next day. And you've got this continuity of people. You get to know these people even more. You really deepen the bond. Whereas like at a bigger convention, you are, if you see someone, you might see them again, but you're probably not. Let's be honest. Do you feel the same way? Like that you have, sure, I love bigger conventions for playing games, for trying new games, for demonstrating my stuff, or as a business, UK Games Expo will always be better than going to a tiny thing with 300 people. Of course it will. But um, as a getting to know people, playing games, fostering those human connections, I think that less than 300 is probably my favorite size. What about you, Fabrizio? Yeah, I I simply love to go to conventions. Uh, I love to go them, to, to them as a visitor uh, before. I, I was part of organization of conventions for like such a long time, since I was a teenager, basically, uh, back in Brazil. And um, so I think you're completely right. It's like a bliss to go there and meet new people and play with them and see what they like and see um, how people are playing games and which kind of games they like. So mm. this is amazing. And this year was my first year uh, as a company going to conventions. And oh, cool. it was super cool as well. Uh, I mean, of course, as you said, the, the return is not uh, financially like uh, <laughs> that good, that's for sure, especially because I went to the UK for uh, conventions. So it's uh, kind of far away from me here in Sweden. But uh, anyway, it was super fun. And for me, the best thing is like going to a convention and see people playing your game and see people playing in general, not just your game, but uh, it, it's super cool environment. I, I really... And when Fabrizio says your game, Fabrizio says my game, Hyper Wars. I mean, as much nah, as yes. I'm sure you love pe seeing of people course, play of my games, then, yes. you know... People play my, my game, Hyper Wars, exactly. <laughs> but um, the other thing is, of course, that I do have a Kickstarter of my own running just now. There's just over a week left. It is at 114 backers, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so left to right, you can see there's four games that I've already got. This is a photo of the actual cards. Um, it's a game about drawing creatures, complementing the drawings, then complementing the compliments on the left, which is meant to make you smile. A game about counting cat ships and colours that keeps getting trickier, which you see just beside it, where it is a speed game, but people who win get more cards to make it harder for themselves than a game about quickly matching words to pictures but never words to words or pictures to pictures even with two people this can be super chaotic and finally a game about cute comical creatures and trying to identify them after some mixed noises and these are all games that have been busy bargain bags people have enjoyed them and now i want to bring them out as a small tuck box edition so it's still fairly cheap. It's £29 and you get four different games. So please, if you haven't already, do go and check that out. You've not played any of these games, have you, Fabrizio? Yes, definitely. I, I think the only one I haven't played is the, the one with the cats. I think I didn't play that. But I well, played all the other ones. You have? Oh, well, I... yeah, yeah. I did, yeah. How did you play them? I played them with you once in your show. We played the the one with the cat, the the making noises, uh, and I, hey, welcome. And we've played once the 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 compliments game uh, in a very fast. I don't remember where exactly. I don't know if it was over Discord or if it was here. I don't remember actually. But uh, we we played that as well. But the cat the cats one I didn't play. That's for sure. But um, 
there are so many games and I think that's if you get this pack it will be a lovely bundle for you know you have to have a wonderful time with your casual friends or family none of them are super strategic and I would like in a couple of days when you're relaunch when you're relaunching Hyper Wars to actually get to the point of how to bring strategy into speed games because for me this is a fascinating topic and I would like to talk more about it. But nice. as I said, today we are going to talk about just the developments and what makes things longer or shorter to make. But first of all, what is a brilliant thing, brilliant thing? What's a little thing which is brilliant? What would you say is something that's brilliant? What's something we can appreciate in the world around us? I mean, one thing I will mention is right now it is sunny and there's rain on my window. And through the rain, I can see, you know, just a little bit of illumination on every single raindrop with blue sky. If I lean my head really far down, blue sky behind some of them. And that's just glorious. The mixture of rain and sun. I love that. What's your brilliant thing of the day, Fabrizio? Do you know what Fica is, Bess? Fica? No, I don't know it. Is this a Portuguese term? No, actually, it's Swedish. Okay. So uh, Fika is a, let's say, the, um, the moment in the, in the day where you stop uh, your day to uh, have a coffee or eat some sweets and sometimes with your uh, friends uh, together. So it's basically tea time in, uh, in Sweden. It's very common for Swedes to do this uh, in the middle of the, the afternoon, around like, say, two or three in the afternoon, everybody wants to... Uh, get together and have some coffee and so on. So for me, the brilliant thing today is Fika because I was, I'm, I'm going through like a very rushed week. And uh, on uh, last Friday, my friends uh, invited me over for a Fika and it was like delightful because it was a moment to like stop a little bit and uh, break from work and have uh, some uh, uh, um, coffee and, and pastries with them. So it was super good. Super good. That sounds wonderful. I mean, that sounds like, I mean, having some sort of tea time and a moment to pause and reflect, I just think that's super wonderful. And yeah, and a quick hello to Elaine. It is lovely to see you and thank you for that compliment. I really appreciate you firstly making yourself known and also just, you know, bringing it up. And I love Sate trying to redesign my games. Kitty Cataclysm as a Euro game of cat placement. Maybe mash it up with <laughs> I Love Cats. Um, feels like it might be a bit too similar to Frank West's efforts there. Um, a game about quickly grabbing something in a thematic Amerifrash game of picking up and delivering vegetables in a post-apocalyptic wasteland devoid of nutrition, where people need to get their veggies in order to avoid scurvy. I love this. And, yeah. And Sate says, I like this sometimes, that's what Lane said. Yes. I mean, no one's lovely all the time. It's true. And so, thank you for making the compliments realistic. But, as always, please feel free to ask questions, keep the comments coming, and that's why I do this stuff live. And when we're talking about the main topic, how long does a game take to make? I mean, it's a really weird thing, because from one perspective, everything that you've ever done in your life pushes you towards some inspiration. If you say, oh, what was the inspiration for this game? Like, for a game about quickly matching words to pictures, but never words to words or pictures to pictures, I played it with my parents and one of them said, oh, this is really interesting. Were you inspired by Snap? And I'm not sure if I might have played Snap once just so I could say I've played it, but I'm not sure I've ever actually played it, which is an interesting thing. And so I was really more inspired by games that might have been inspired by that whole legacy of things, the whole heritage of everything going on. And but at the same time, you are inspired by maybe a childhood memory that could spark something. You could, but it, I think that when we define time working on the game, we can't be talking about just 
generally playing stuff and being inspired by games or we have to be thinking okay when we're actively trying to work out the problems when we're actively thinking how could this manifest what are the possible rules how are we brainstorming different possible mechanisms what's going on here and so that feels yeah and elaine does also want to say moments to pause are so important and that's a great brilliant thing from fabricio and thanks, thanks. but um yeah how would you define time spent working on a game because simil similarly i mean yogi is not finished i mean i know that at least one person has told me off for telling backers that my bezzy bargain bags are not finished but frankly yogi which is sold fairly well i'm going to suggest i'm not announcing anything but let's say hypothetically there was another edition to come up hypothetically. Let's say hypothetically that they were to do a rebranding, maybe do new artwork. That would give me hypothetically, um, entirely hypothetically, an opportunity to reconsider all the cards. And I am willing to publicly say there's at least one card in Yogi where I would like hand on a knee to not be in the original deck. Because yes, that's fun it's like nice to have this one lower body thing but it feels weird having that one card now that i'm still happy with it and i'm not going to make it a war game set on an alien battlefield where your acrobatics might be life or death for the planet as much as i love that and i might actually do the game about quickly grabbing pick up and deliver speed vegetables that seems like quite a fun concept but um pick up and deliver speed game um but yes it's and like originally 54 cards was because i felt like this is what it needs to be but it turns out when you're printing 10 20 30 000 at a time it's less important so i could have gone to 60 cards and maybe i would want to hypothetically put in five new cards the point is a game is in a sense never done but are we agreed that we are fundamentally talking from starting earnest work on it to first publication. That seems like a reasonable time frame, right? Yeah, it does. I mean, as you said, uh, no things are ever done, right? Until we say so, that's the thing. Things are done when we are done with the things. So that the that mm -hmm. I think this is the the what comes to my mind when when talking about like how actively are you working on something and so on. So I. I have this uh, idea that every time I, I realize I'm not working on something for too long, I tend to shelve it. Like, okay, let's put it on a shelf. Let, let, let's keep it there for a while. Let's make it official that I'm not working on uh, something. Because otherwise, there is always like something looming on my head. Like, uh, okay, so sh should I still go back to that and so on? So I completely agree with you that we need to s establish like critical moments where you say, okay, now I'm done with this, or now I have postponed this for a while. And That's a really interesting thing about being mindful about what you're working on. For me, it's very much of just what's attracting me at that moment. On Friday, I am going to go to playtest because I always do on a daytime playtest. That's what I do on Fridays. And I'll make something on Thursday. I'll decide what's we're going to play. And I kind of invented a new game on Saturday, Sunday, and it's not a super complex game. It's a simple twist for a quiz game. And I think it might have actually been heavily inspired by Dave from Loser Palooza, and it's also been inspired by this terrible game. And that's, I'm not, but it's all about making the content, but I still want to make sure that the structure itself works fine. So, but maybe the day before I'll be thinking, you know what, there's something else that's a bigger priority. And for me, I see it as being, for me at least, opportunistic. What am I excited to make? What's going to be worth testing? What am I most uncertain about? That's almost how yeah. I work on these things where, yes, I'm working on 10, 20 things at once and things don't get officially put on the shelf. They just get forgotten about and i don't have a gloomy feeling because i've got 19 other things or occupying my mind do you know what i mean 
Yeah, yeah, definitely, I do. Yeah, sure. But I, but I also t tend to to separate, uh, let's say, cre more creative, free creative moments and moments where I'm working on something with my creativity. I think those are two different stuff for me as well. I I completely see the the feeling you're describing now because that's the same I do. Like sitting down on a Saturday afternoon and come up with an idea for a game and sketching something or just try a very simple prototype just in front of me to see if the very basic stuff works and something like this. Then, I don't know, calling a friend and saying, okay, do you want to come over and I, I can show you something mm. that's nice. So this is one moment and I, I love those moments. I love this uh, I, spark of creation. Like, okay, now I can do everything. It's just a, a blank sheet and I, I don't care about this. It's just like a, coming up with whatever I feel like. And this is when I think most of my uh, inspiration comes and the, the um, inspiration that I have from other games and from other stuff in my life. Uh, and that's really brilliant. But then there is a time where you say, okay, now I see that this game has jumped out of this phase. And now this, this game wants to be developed really. So there is, an, as you said, an opportunity here to move along with that. And then I normally won't take this game anymore on my Saturday afternoons or something. It's going to be more like, okay, now I'm going to put this into my schedule and I'm going to work on Hyper Wars. I'm going to work on this other game. I'm not going to work on this. And then, of course, I will still work creatively uh, inside the, the the boundaries of that I set for the game. But, I'd but like I to take those... a step back and keep talking about that initial moment because those initial yes. moments, I think they look very different for you. They look different for me. I mean, right now I'm in a new place, but and it's hard to just have someone over, unfortunately, for me for playing games. But let's talk about that initial thing. And when do you consider a game to have officially started? For me, I would say game design has properly started when I'm thinking through the ramifications of what things might be. And sometimes like I might start 10 things in a day, but then I also abandon them straight away. And it's like, okay, maybe I come back to that. But if I'm thinking, oh, I don't like this quiz game. This is, let, we played a quiz game on Saturday. It was very boring. It was literally just people answer yes or no. And then also we were annoyed at the questions. But, um, and if you're correct, you get a point. Add up your points. Most points wins. That's the entire game. And so it's very bland. It's uninspiring. And because we didn't want to start writing our answers and like at a certain point, we did do the thumbs up, votes, yes or no. So you can do that simultaneously. But we were saying yes or no and discussing it. And that was interesting. We wanted to facilitate that. And I was thinking, well, what if the game um did give you let's say two points for um being first and then zero points for being last so maybe you want to not be the last person to vote correctly you can't just wait for everyone else to show you the way you need to still get in there there's a little bit of speed how would that work now what's the ramifications of that and what's the ramifications if we slightly change that scoring what's the ramifications if it's um free and then two, and then everyone else gets one, and then the last person gets zero. What's the ramifications if it's two bonus points for first? Well, and then once I'm actually pondering this, once I'm actually considering how people would react, and maybe that's through the lens of myself, maybe that's through the lens of having watched many other people play games and imagining what they would do. I think that's the moment when I feel like, okay, game design has started thinking about what's possible and thinking it through. What would you consider as the initial starting point for you? Nice. Maybe it's something quite close of what you just described, but um, I, I wouldn't describe like the ramifications. Of course, ramifications are a huge part of uh, game design. I completely agree. Um, but for me, every time I, I started creating a game, the first thing that comes to my mind is what is the, the feeling I want the player to feel when playing or when finishing this game or when they finally get the objective uh, in this game? And then for me, game design really starts when I find 
at least one mechanism that I can use to give that feeling. When I, when I finally connect those two things at first, then I say, okay, now I have a game to work on. Now this is a, a thing that could become a proper game. I really like that. So you are talking about, I mean, creativity in the whack of a whack on the side of the head and the kick in the seats of the pants, two books that I absolutely recommend to everyone. There are some notes about creativity being about making links that other people might not be able to. And that link is what can drive something new because, hey, Sates made the point that we combine pick up and deliver and speed. And sure, there might already be something like that that exists, but pick up and deliver and speed and vegetables. Now, obviously, two of those things already existed in my game. Two of those things already existed in another game, but bringing all three of them together, now I can see new connections with, okay, maybe you're placing cards. Maybe you've got like a, maybe it's a cooperative game. I don't know. Like, I guess I've also got to make sure that it's not too similar to Dave Turksey's speed games, which are really good, by the way. But anyway, um, making those connections is really interesting way to put it. Now, we've talked about prototyping. I don't want to get too much into the how to decide, but I want to talk about the length of time and what might make it longer or less long. So how long until you prototype? It sounds like for you, it will be always within a couple of hours. That's completely correct. I, for me, it's very hard to work without at least a uh, um, white paper. Uh... <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Vegetables, the newest mechanism to be listed on Board Game Geek, says Xate. That's a great mechanism. I like them, yeah. <laughs> also, actual cooking. So it's a yes. game about um, cooking your vegetables, but there are no cards. It's an actual cooking game. There are literal yeah. vegetables. But, but to be fairly honest, I, I, I have an idea for a game that the setup is cooking and then actual actually the the pieces they are edible you have actually you have actually to eat the pieces during the game so i think this would be like a a great christmas game like a, i don't know something like that <laughs> uh, so um well uh, yeah so i was talking about prototypes i cannot um really uh, be able to play something just in my head i normally have to have at least a very simple prototype at first uh, so I can just, I don't know, draw something on a paper and then move them, uh, and cut some pieces of paper and move them around, or they take some bits from other games or, uh, prototyping material I have and do some, some stuff like that. I don't know. I, for, uh, like I have a good example. I, I have made a, uh, hidden movement game that takes place in a cemetery. And the, the game is quite big, like the board and everything. But the first prototype, I made it on an A5 uh, piece of paper. And I just took some cubes and I was, oh, this actually works. I can actually have this feeling if I go more and more into this mechanism. So yeah, I, I, I need to prototype like as soon as possible. Um, I think that I do like if the game is about moving bits around and that's the key thing, then of course it does help if you are moving bits around and seeing what happens. Like for this was back in 2015, I was making a game with a bit of a complex resource production mechanism and I was like, okay, things are going to come out here. Is there enough resources? I need to get the that's broadly correct and let's just go through the cycle one player i'm not saying i played it like multiple players just ignoring everything else and just saying looking at this one aspect of the game but i don't feel i can actually get a lot of value from that until i'm seeing other people playing it if i'm playing mm -hmm. it myself it'll be to examine one particular number it will be to say, is the growth of, maybe I want the resources in this game to generally dwindle. And I'll be thinking about the maths behind that. Or maybe I want it to increase or stay the same, whatever. 
and you can math that out. That's perfectly reasonable. But in terms of the emotions, I would say that either I need to um, watch people play it or just sit back and imagine it myself. Because when it's a quiz game, when it's um, something about people voting other people, sure. Yeah, for me, I guess the honest truth here is if I if it's easier to prototype, I will prototype it faster. If I get more value from watching it being played, I will prioritize that. If I feel like, hey, this game, I can actually understand broadly in my mind how this is going to be played because maybe it's another party game and I've done like more than 10 of those at this point and I can sort of get a handle on. I might just launch straight into making content. I might straight spend um, a few weeks just typing up funny card ideas because I'm already so confident that the game itself is going to be fun. And I'm at the point where, sure, quite often it might be like, hey, this is probably terrible, but it will be really interesting to check it and double check. Or maybe I have no idea about this, but hopefully it will lead to something. Of course, I'm going to play test those things. But there are points where through experience, through having seen things over and over, I can be more confident. And I, can, I would not advise this for first time designers. I would always advise playtesting play as soon as you absolutely can so that it keeps you on the right track. But for me, because I've got limited opportunities to playtest, and this Friday I could be playtesting, you know, 20 different things. And so. I'm probably not going to play test the thing that I already have a fairly decent idea how the broad structure is going to be. And sure, I might have to tweak something, but if I may, if I spend two weeks generating interesting true or false questions, even if the structure needs to change, those true or false questions are still going to be used within that within that quiz game. Do you know what I mean? Whereas if it's a game like Hyper Wars, which sure, I'm not saying it's not social, any speed game, it's about the people, it's about the passing of the cards, but I feel like you have to um, tailor those cards more specifically to the structure of the game and to the environment. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, thought, Des, because I, I think that your initial process, when you start creating content, for the game, like the questions you mentioned, or some abilities for your cards, or something like this, this has a big potential to influence all your development in the end, right? Mm. So I, I've done this before in games that they had a lot of cards involved, or like I don't know, action cards or something like this, and then you create a lot of actions, and at some point in the game, the game has changed so much that those cards they don't make any more sense to the game, or not many of them, maybe. Uh, and then you start feeling that this content is kind of uh, uh, holding you back now because I mean now I need to change this. The game has changed enough, so the so yeah. But I, 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 I guess your... it's also about thinking how reusable is this content. Yeah. And I'll just um, lock that YouTube user. And over on Facebook, Tin Star Game says forever. Are you saying that it's forever until you prototype? Because I understand that you're. Or are you just saying it takes forever to make a game? Not sure what you mean there, but it's lovely to have you and I hope you're generally well. Um, now let's carry on. So how long would you say it carries up until the structure is set? In the terms of Hyper Wars, you started what time in 2018? You keep saying 2018. Yeah. A year is a long time. Are we talking yes. which month? Uh, we're talking about uh, March 2018. Okay, so you started off and then you had this idea. Let's actually talk specifically about that because I'll, you know, allow you to hype you up your Kickstarter a wee bit. So what was the initial spark of this? Um, and you did you play test it straight away? Yeah, so the initial spark for Hyper Wars was actually a video game. Uh, mm -hmm. I was playing a video game called... Um, Towerfall Ascension. 
uh, it's a super interesting game. You don't play it online. You can only play on, on your uh, room, on your couch with your friends. It's a competitive game, and it's about like throwing arrows at each other. Uh, the the last player standing is uh, the winner. Of course, Hyperwars has nothing to do with throwing arrows or something like that. Yeah, exactly this one. This is one of my favorite games. I love it. And uh, so I had this feeling that this game gives you this feeling of urgency, that something is going to happen if you don't throw an arrow at someone, or if you don't do something, or if you don't attack, or if you don't hide. So it's always rushed, always very, very uh, uh, stressful, let's say. Um, you can play it cooperatively, but the, the mode I like the most is like uh, pl players versus players. Uh, and then I was thinking, can I make a board game that can convey this same feeling? Where I or I will have this feeling that something's about to happen, that I need to act and I need to act fast, where I cannot pay attention to everything that my opponents are doing and stuff like this. I mean, so this to... was this part. And this feels like a super cute, pixely version of, I don't know, Super Smash Brothers. It feels like a big combat driven, um, you know, beat them up. Is that basically what I'm seeing? Is that correct? More or less. It's not as, uh, let's say, overpowered as uh, Smash Super Smash Brothers, but uh, yeah, it's the same, same type of uh, combat. It's like uh, everyone versus everyone. And you wanted to keep that feeling of, whoa, what's going on? And that yeah. manic feeling. And so let's talk about, so how long did it take you until you prototyped? 30 days, basically. So uh, and I, I had a... long for you. So 30 days of mulling around in your mind, how can I make this happen? Yeah, so because the, the prototype at first, for me, it was very hard to understand how I would make uh, this feeling to, to show up. I, I, it wasn't a real-time board game yet. It was like, okay, maybe I can do this by, I don't know, maybe having some uh, mini games around or something like this during the game. But eventually it struck me like, ah, this is a real-time game actually. People need to act fast. That's that's what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And then it took me like some more days to realize that I needed a map and then I needed some cards and then what the cards would do and so on. So it took me like about 30 days to put a first prototype uh, together. Uh, I have And did you have the key decision types. of, okay, I'm using my cards and then I give my cards to my opponents and then I pass yes. them around. So that was so always was, there from the start. This was the first mechanism I, I came uh, I came to. Like the passing cards around for me was the, the way you you could influence your opponents. You could pressure them. I think by this passing is the parts of the game, genuinely, and I'm very excited to try Thank it. You. So yeah, so it was uh, pretty fast, and then uh, because I had a trip to Brazil that was booked, and I wanted to take the first prototype to my friends there to play, so that's why I had like to rush and make it happen in thirty days or something. So yeah. So then, you presumably tried broad different things of broadly what can cards do, what are people even really trying for, what's the scope of this game, and then eventually they're like, okay. I've worked out the basic rules. Now the rules are set, but I'm still working out the details of the cards who are basically into the point of development um, to use board game parlance. And how long would you say it took until the overall structure was definitely there? Yeah, I I think it didn't take that long for the overall structure to, to take place, like having players with cards, passing cards around and putting meeples on the board and also uh, resources to fulfill a demand, which is exactly the, the core of the game. So this was there from, let's say, almost the beginning. I would say maybe the second or third playtest uh, I did already had everything in, in place, of course. Many things changed after that, but not this core um, structure. And so what at this point how long do you think the design took i mean it's not been published yet but so you've not really made the game yet do you think that's fair to say like you've sent it to reviewers you've had physical copies of the game but would you agree that you've not really made the game in the way you wanted because you wanted more than just 10 copies of the game to exist yeah. in the world right 
made made or not made for me it's only a matter of your what is your goal with the game right and my goal is to publish the game so i completely agree that it's not made yet i have made a lot of other games that only have has one copy and uh, yeah i play them with my friends but that's fine but uh, it's not the case that's for a really Wars. interesting perspective i really loved that how whether you have made something it depends on your goal yeah it's absolutely so simple and i just want to repeat that so if my goal is to make one copy of a game and hand make one copy and you know paint it maybe i sleeve it so that the art you know stays on the card so that it doesn't get damaged and then i give it to a friend as a birthday present you know it'll be a time consuming birthday present but like you know maybe that's the birthday present where hey this is a game made specially for you and this or maybe it's just i wanted one copy for myself to keep for myself so that I could play it with anyone who comes over. And I think it's all contextual. If I were someone who was just going for the second, then a game where a new bladder, blah, 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 would already be made. But my goal is to spread that joy to other people because I am, I've got a bit of an ego. I want to have an impact, not just on those I directly interact with, but maybe even on those far away around the world. So of course I would love to have multiple copies of this game. And, but then even then it's like my goal for Yogi might be to sell a million copies to reach millions of people. So then would you say okay. that I've not really made that game yet? Which... Yeah, I, I guess it's all connected to your, to your goal in the end, right? Because uh, if you won't feel accomplished until you have sold a million copies of Yogi, then yeah, of course you haven't made it that yet. So yeah, it's, it's still ongoing, I guess. I like that. I'm actually quite excited to think, hey, there's something left for me to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, obviously lots of it is down to luck and down to the publishers and everything, but you know, I can still have some small influence. And of course, um, yeah, it was, reassuring that such people they were like yeah of course we're going to listen to you i mean yeah i mean yeah. sometimes it's nice to be reminded that they do still care about you. <laughs> but well. um anyway so how long until the kick first kick started i've actually forgotten the dates of the it was last year the first one was last year yes it was the 28th of september 2021 oh. And what made you feel like you were ready in September 2021? So for me, it was uh, all about having uh, reviews done, uh, check that people were actually liking the game. Uh, and of course, having all my uh, graphic design and rules completely done. So uh, this was when I decided I was ready. I, I guess I was missing a lot of marketing, which I fixed, I guess, for the, the next iteration but um and that's something I, I think it's quite interesting to to talk about but uh at that point in time i had some marketing uh i had a brand around uh, hyper wars and i wanted to show it so that's why i i tried that at that point i feel like okay we've been dodging around the question of what actually makes a game take longer and I mm -hmm. quickly wrote up a few ideas. So it's to do with the complexity of the game. I mean, a shorter game, it might take a lot more time to get that spark. And you have to, I would say, for a simpler game, you probably have to keep making lots of other simple games until you arrive at V1. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yes. But then for a more complex game, you'll have that thing and then you'll keep working on it and tweak numbers and that will take a lot more time. I would say that also experience, like sometimes if you've got more experience, not just in making games, what with that thing specifically, like with Magic the Gathering, you know, they keep talking about, yeah, if we're making a, the new mechanism will be the one that we have to spend more time on to try to properly balance. The ones that we know, of course, we know how valuable a creature with flying is or with trample. But if we've got a new mechanism of hyperventilate, 
then how good is a creature with hyperventilate? And then when you tap it, you can um, add free counters to other. I don't know. I I mean I'm just. Or, doing or maybe there counter. would be a or maybe there would be a magic mechanism called vegetables. I don't know. Let's see. Mm. Yeah, the vegetable <laughs> mechanism where yeah. tap the card and then you need to cook a vegetable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, like if you've done a lot of party games or sometimes like with deck building, I'm sure that the first deck building game when Don it old X Vacarino was, well, it, whether you consider that to be absolutely the first or not, let's not go down that road. But it was still really pushing into uncharted territory. And when you do that, of course, it's going to take a little bit longer to make that thing. And then also the possibility to play test, how many times a week can you do it? How many people can you get to come over? And also, of course, your own personal energy. Are you able to take in all the lessons from this play test? Are you able to spend a lot of time brainstorming? How much time are you able to give it? I, I guess it's also time and energy. And so what else would, I guess the other thing that we mentioned, yes, it does depend on your goals. Sometimes I kind of think, you know, for a game about drawing creatures, complementing the drawings and complementing the complements, my goal wasn't to make this the best possible version of that game that could possibly exist, to be honest. My goal was to make this a great version of that game, hopefully, but just because nothing else like it existed, I wanted it to be out there. Similarly, with a game about wee whimsical creatures and trying to identify the monsters who make noises, I could have spent, you know, many more months pondering the creatures. And the difference between a game about cute comical creatures and wee whimsical creatures is me having that intervening time to realize, oh, these are the facets that make it possible to have different noises but for the first version it was just hey this is a brand new thing i don't know if people will be into it i just want it to exist i don't need it like what's the level of quality you need and honestly it doesn't always need to be nothing can be the best possible thing it's always about how much time are you willing to give it would you agree i completely i mean for me looking for the best something it's always like uh, I don't know. It's 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 not worth it most of the time. Because I mean, of course, you can spend as as much time as you want on something and then make it better and better and better and better. But eventually, you're gonna be wasting more time than actually using up your time to make it better. It's you're just gonna hit a plateau or something. And for me, at least nowadays, uh, maybe this has changed in the in the last few years or something. I'm much more connected to my feeling of accomplishment with something than to be able to say this is the best that this mm. could have been so for me it's much more about okay how can i actually have some accomplishment with that how can i actually have some uh, closure after this journey or something like that yeah i absolutely agree and for me it's kind of like maybe this is i mean i'm never sure what's egocentric and what's just trying to be a good person like where do you draw the line sometimes trying to be a valuable not trying to be a good person but trying to be a good designer like i like mm -hmm. to believe that all my things have some value and for a game that is um let's be honest kitty cataclysm isn't the most original thing out there sure it has the nation of cards that's a new thing and there's little twists but fundamentally there's no whoa you're making noises and people are listening to them there's no like one sentence thing like okay are compliments in drawings and compliments and compliments like within two seconds i've told you something that you're doing in no other game there's nothing that i can say about kitty cataclysm where okay you get too many cards and then there's that tension of whether you've got too many cards, that's not the key part. Um, that you, the cards you discard are in a personal discard. Sure, that works, but it feels like a fusion of a lot of other things that's already existed. And it feels like, okay, then it has to kind of, the thing that makes it work 
Kitty Cataclysm, to my mind, was the fact that it was a fairly chaotic party game. It is a fairly chaotic party game, I should say, because I've still it still exists. There's a copyright there in front of me, although it's out of stock. But it's actually kind of well balanced. That sure, there's better hands and worse hands, but there's actual options. There's things to consider. And I needed to spend a lot of time balancing to make sure that that played out, that that core experience was there. Uh, whereas if it's broadly, hey, even by virtue of existing, if a game, I mean, I believe that I did a good job of it, but even if a game about drawing creatures complemented the drawings and complemented the compliments had been, let's say I'd stopped working on it, um, you know, halfway through the process. Let's say I'd done half as much work as I actually did. I'm not talking about doing it more faster or doing it more efficiently. I'm just talking about doing less work. I still think it would have had value just because it's so outlandish. But, um, you know, again, if I'm now thinking about, I would like genuinely to make an abstract strategy game for two players to compete. There's all the information. Now, how good does that game need to be? That game needs to be really bloody good because otherwise, um, why would you play this thing as opposed to the hundreds and hun thousands of other things that already exist? I mean, sure, maybe there's a small aspect of value for people who just want to play a new game today and they don't have a new abstract strategy game that they can play today. I mean, maybe there's another one that gets designed tomorrow, but I'm like, their favorite game of that moment. But like and i still would like to spend and i think that goal is all contextual so what how would you um categorize hyper wars in these things i mean how would you rate it in terms of complexity in terms of your own experience of such things in terms of your possibilities to play test your own time and energy and the goals that you had yeah, that's a pretty cool question. That's because I, I think that what you were saying before about how how much longer can take a game if you if you are onto, onto something different, something new, as for example with uh, the, um, the Compliments game or uh, Dominion when it was made and stuff like that. And I think I have a similar feeling with uh, Hyper Wars. Of course, there are a lot of real time games, and in all of them, you have some sort of dexterity component where you have to uh, rush and so on. But I really feel that Hyper Wars uh, has a unique thing about having to think about and deploy real time a strategy. strategy. Yes, exactly. It's a real time strategy. Five game. syllables. How many games yeah. can you say that's about? Generally, exactly. I mean, I can think of less than five. Yeah, exactly. That's so I think lot. this is quite unique about the, the game. And this maybe was the reason why for me, to, when I started the project, I, I swear, honest, I was, I was doing Hyper Wars because I wanted to make a game that I could produce faster. Because I was doing another game that was much longer, would take like a long time to play test and to produce and everything. And I thought, okay, I need to learn how to do a Kickstarter. So I'll make a game that I can take to Kickstarter in a year. And then, fine, I'm going to learn this. Ha, yeah, sure. Four years later, here am I, uh, still doing Hyper Wars. So, yeah, that's that's completely crazy. And, and I think this is one of the reasons, because I... I, I hit something interesting there and I was like, okay, I can't just let this go. I need to make this game better than it is. Uh, so I, I, I can give it to people in a better moment so they can actually enjoy it. And that's going to take longer. I mean, that that's all I can do. So, yeah. I guess there's also the aspect of how much does this thing matter? I mean, with a game about we whimsical creatures and trying to identify the monsters so makes noises sure um like as long as those creatures are broadly diverse and they have enough things going on that they can inspire you somewhat it doesn't need to be ideal and you can still have fun with it for a bit of time but hyper wars i think that's anything where even kitty cataclysm where the numbers actually matter you know you do need a ridiculous number of playtests and ridiculous num amounts of maths and gets out to make sure that all these things are properly balanced. 
because if halfway through the game you're like, wait a minute, um, that one thing, I will always do this one thing in this one way, because those games are not performance and communication or communication or expressive related, they're about um, discrete decisions categorized and offered to us and countable by the game things that we then have to say this these are two options that i'm uncertain about and if you remove that uncertainty if there's ever the collapse of you know strategic com- possibilities that's basically what they call a broken game and for yes. a party game it might not be the worst thing in the world because you've already had that enjoyable social experience but for something where it is all about okay i've managed to manipulate these numbers and these actions and it's thing better than you you have to take a little bit more care of those things and it's about what do you focus on the broad strokes or the details and i yeah. think part of that is also the experience of understanding what matters and how much things matter yeah, exactly. I think the broad strokes in Hyperwars at least were like very early on, but Mm-mm-mm. finding finding the fine details to make the strategy matter was very hard. And part of it, for example, there is one of, one of the mechanics in the game is that you have a bag and you throw some cubes inside of it, and then you take you take you you, took, you throw three cubes inside and you take three cubes out of it in one single action. And at first, the bag was empty. At the beginning of the game and this meant that you always knew what you're gonna get in the end so i had to, actually it was not just one action it was two actions at first one action to add uh, cubes and one action to remove cubes but if you always did uh add cubes and remove cu- remove cubes in sequence every time you would always know what you would get because it would be like, okay, I throw three cubes inside, I take the same three cubes from the the bag, and that's that. So, and this gave you like no uh, strategic options. You always had to play it like this. Uh, but then this was changing, of course. Now the game, when you start the game, you already have nine nine cubes inside your bag. So the only thing you can actually try to do is to influence the outcome of what you're picking up. And of course, then I paired those two actions together. So you always take uh, three in and three out. But since you have this uh, different uh, amount of cubes and types of cubes inside your bag, then it becomes a sort of a bag building game in a sort of sense. Uh, so Why did you decide to put things in before you take them out? So when you're putting things yeah, in the bag, to... is it always put things in and then taking them out? Yes, exactly. Because yeah. I was thinking, if you put things in and then take them out, then you need to presumably shake them in the middle. And you but, need to, yeah, exactly. um, yeah. if you were to take things out and then put things in, then the next person doesn't even need to shake because it will already be shaken just in the process yeah. of picking it up. So that would actually... To be very honest, I never, I never tried this uh, on reverse. And it makes a lot of sense, to be honest, yeah. But because of course you need to you need to shake, but you're you're not allowed to look into your bag anyway. Yeah, yeah of course. So, uh, but it but, just feels uh, yeah. like then you don't have that whole oh did I shake enough? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because and it can be like shake, take, put in. It feels a little bit smoother. But yeah, um, yeah, it, it could completely be that. Yeah, for sure. What was the last? Maybe I should, maybe I should try it. Yeah, <laughs> I think you should. Maybe it could be a last minute change. What was the well, last not, yeah. um, change that you made to the game? I mean, ignoring the graphics and production, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what was the last mechanical change you made? The last mechanical change was about the beginning of the game. At first, the game started with no uh, meeples anywhere in any of the boards. Uh, but two of the actions, they are dependent on the existence of a meeple there. So, of course, first action for everyone was to add one meeple. So I just cut that out and I started, now the game starts with one meeple from each player in one of the boards. You just pick and choose. So that adds to the strategic options because you can choose like the board with more points on it or the one that is closest mm-hmm. to you because you can affect it faster. Or uh, if you want to go for competition and straight away go into some uh, the, a board that is closer to someone else, 
So you, you add on this. That was the last thing I changed. Just to give a little bit of also, I guess, starting asymmetry. Yeah, before exactly. the timer I, I think it, Yeah, I think it helps a little bit with that. Of course, it's a very light uh, uh, asymmetry, but still. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're not talking roots level is here. We're yeah, just yeah, course, yeah. talking, having, uh, starting from not just the cards in your hand, but changing those starting positions marginally just to give a bit of different texture to the game rather than it being the focus and how long ago was that tweak to the starting positions it was about 18 months before i ago yeah oh wow so um for the last 18 months there have been no changes to the numbers or effects on any of the cards not at all so um has that been because none of your playtesters have had any suggestions why do you why what made you uh, has it been a decision from yourself i'm not going to make any more changes what's yeah yeah when let's talk about this finishing yeah. So the, um, the play tests after that, so let's say almost every play test uh, since the last year, <laughs> the, the bag build a while. <laughs> and uh, so the, since the like beginning of last year or something like this, I haven't changed the game anymore. And in every play test session, I get new feedback, of course, but it's either something that was uh, said and suggested before and didn't work, or people are yeah, just regularly happy with that i also think that when people play a game that has like a very high fidelity prototype they also i don't know they, they struggle a little bit more to give feedback i think because they they see it from the get-go as a more like ready product product mm -hmm. so unless they see something very wrong about the game maybe they won't mention it they were like yeah sure so this is the game like uh, yeah i don't know it's not like you're going to get a, your copy of Root and you're going to play it and then you're going to go to the designer of Root and say, yeah, I just played your game and I have this feedback. You should change this, this, and this. Because, I mean, it's a game you bought on a store. So, it's, of course, you can you can offer your your feedback. But, uh, yeah, you shouldn't expect much on regards of changes. I mean, it's an interesting thing because, yeah, knowing whether people are open to that or not, because at this point, like if people hypothetically, I mean, I'm not going to, I was going to say, I'm not going to redesign Yogi to be a post-apocalyptic war game, but never say never. But considering what it is, like if you have ideas for, let's say a hypothetical, oh, this card I didn't like, or oh, why was that card that way? I am always, I always appreciate this kind of feedback, even if it's on a game that's finished i mean to me that's just what a review kind of should be of why was yes. it this way and why wasn't it another way because you can say um this is the things that i liked and these are the things that i didn't like but there's also always the thing of well if you didn't like those things is it that those things were just never going to appeal to you and they were as good as they could be, or was it the case that a small twist could have made it better for you while still delivering the same core experience for everyone else at the table? And that's exactly. an interesting no, I, question. I yeah, that's really cool. And I think feedback is always, good feedback is always good for you. I think it's always mm -hmm. nice, even if it's not gonna impact directly your current game. Uh, maybe it will in the future. Maybe it will give uh, new ideas for, I don't know, an expansion or something like that, mm -hmm. or yeah, a second edition or I don't know. So these kind of things. I I think it's very valuable anyway. Uh, but I don't know if someone comes to a to a, a my UKG booth and would say play Hyper Wars, and then they would say, mm, I don't know, I think this game should have turns. I was going to say, yeah, sure, <laughs> thanks, but uh, yeah, I, I can't head that way right now. So that's the. I mean. Could it have a non-real-time mode just to for your first play so that it's like, okay, we're playing this way just so everyone understands the rules. 
we've had, I mean, in your game, you've got these different rule levels. The idea being that you start off with level one, and then I think you've got, okay, now everyone understands this. You want to add some more complexity. Let's go to level two. And then, okay, we played a few more games. Once everyone's comfortable, maybe you've advanced to level three and then level four. And even level five, I think, is the highest. And... I, I have done uh, I have done uh, versions of it with uh, turns in a sense more like a tutorial way exactly, yeah, exactly what you mentioned like okay let's let's explain so first of all everyone plays one card and then someone plays one card and then everyone does it everyone still does it simultaneously but then when everyone is done then we pass the card and then we keep but going. it's so... a simultaneous action game where you take as long as the slowest player at the table needs exactly exactly so I, I played like that of course the game doesn't have the same feeling but it still works of course and if you play it that way presumably then a full game would take like 30 minutes potentially rather than 15 minutes yeah maybe so but then the the main the main difference there would be that at the end of the game you lose points based on how many cards you have you still have yeah and you don't get that at all and you don't get that exactly so i mean i don't know maybe you do because you could have a an action that in your turn instead of playing a card you can draw a card from the central deck for example then you just added a new card to your hand and then you keep passing the card but then i guess you're always going to be the one with most card in your hand so i don't see the point really but yeah yeah it definitely feels like you know maybe play a couple of turns like you know i mean would you advise people to play when they're starting a new thing how how does the learning process go how do you normally get people to make sure that no one's making unintentional mistakes because that yeah. is um a key issue with speed games that someone might make an unintentional mistake and normally these mistakes cannot be tracked and yeah, no one else is going to pay any attention to it. Because if I'm watching you, making sure that you're not doing anything wrong, I'm going to probably lose, right? Of course, because you're losing time, exactly. And time is everything mm. in uh, Hyper War, so exactly. But the, the way I played this before, when people are starting to play, is to play without the timer. So there's no time. We just play and, I don't know, until one of the resources uh, is exhausted or uh, when all the... Um, the boards have been fulfilled with all players something like that you can determine another way to finish the game instead of the timer and you just do it because removing the timer has a big impact on how rushed you feel so you still mm -hmm. want to play faster but if you don't have the timer you don't feel the pressure as much because okay i can play this for a longer time maybe so this would be more manageable so that's the way i have done this before Trusting but also them. uh Sorry, just to maybe I, I can mention that. So uh, one thing that is new about the game uh, that is quite recent is that I have made a solo version of the game. So you can play Hyper Wars by, by yourself right now. So there wow. are rules and you, you can do it. Yeah, but it's a very different game. And although one could uh, say that every solo game is a real-time game since you're only playing with yourself, but <laughs> but uh, but it's not. it's really a different game. It's, it's much more pause and it takes around 30 minutes to play really so it's a very different game now um your game is not exactly finished yet because your goal is obviously you've said before to get it published and so maybe at some point in a year or two you know we'll have another chat about how all of this pans out but can you talk for a minute about what's going on here, what the funding goal is, how much it's going to cost for a copy of the game, including shipping. Nice. So the, um, the I'm not going to say talk about the funding goal yet, because to be very honest, I, I have a number, but I'm still working my uh, my math uh, for some last minute changes that I, I had. But uh, but the, the copy, the basic uh, pledge level is going to be $39 uh which i think is uh, a good value for a game with like this much uh, uh components and so on i think it's uh, pretty good and basically the shipping part is very tricky today it's super expensive it's much much more expensive than the when we did the campaign uh, last time uh, to some places it's actually cheaper not that much cheaper but to some places it's way way more expensive now 
Where are you uh, planning to manufacture? In China. Okay. It's, and then it's are you to send it to fulfillment sensors around the world? Is that your plan? Yeah. So yeah, right right now I'm I'm working with two companies. One to distribute it to UK, Europe, and UK, the European Union, and US, North North America, mm -hmm. uh, and one company to distribute it to South America and uh, uh, Africa and uh, Oceania. So uh, that's one? the. So basically, uh, in the UK, I'm working with Sparrow Galaxy. Oh, nice. It's, uh, yeah, they are very nice. I, I truly love the, the, those guys. They are really great mm. uh, and helping me a lot. Um, so they are going to be the distributors for EU, UK and US, Canada and Mexico. Um, and then I'm working with a company called FF Logistics from China. Uh, they have these special lines to Brazil. Because you know I'm Brazilian and I want to include Brazil in this uh, campaign. But to be very honest, the prices for shipping to Brazil right now are crazy high. Mm -hmm. So um, so let's see. I don't know. Um, so many of my Brazilian friends are, are telling me, okay, I want to pay for this, but maybe I don't want to like pay for the 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 shipping. So maybe I'm just gonna give you the money and then you can give me a copy whenever you have one in the future. I don't know, sometime when you come to Brazil or something, because it's uh, it's really expensive right now to get the stuff there. And then when it's all done, will there be some sort of pledge manager or is it just going to be Kickstarter surveys and then it gets shipped out? Uh, no, there's going to be a, a pledge manager. I'm, I'm planning to use Backer Kit and uh, okay. yeah, and this should happen. After. I'm also going to keep uh, selling the game via a sort of pre-order to Kickstarter after the campaign is done, if it's funded. And what went into the decision to use BackerKit? Uh, I think it's a very well-established company. The, the, the help that they give you is uh, quite good. And to be honest, they have the one of the best tools I, I know for, for doing this. Mm. I was meaning as opposed to just doing Kickstarter survey. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel that Kickstarter doesn't give me enough support uh, for these things. And as a as a first time uh, uh, Kickstarter, I I want more help than they give me. Oh, interesting. I would love to talk about more about that. Although maybe on a future show, I've got to be honest. Um, as a backer, if there's a pledge manager, I'm probably not going to pledge because I just know that for me, I'll have, you know, issues, you know, doing it afterwards, because, um, yeah, like, it's just, yeah, it's another thing to have to organize on my end. And I know it's a small thing, but, um, but I would be really interested to hear what the sorts of support that Kickstarter isn't giving you is and maybe that can be a conversation for another time nice yeah that would be great but it has been a lovely show i've asked you a lot of questions i would like to ask you to ask me a question and so let's wrap up with something that can be answered by me and also anyone watching question of the day question of the day here's a little question before we go on our way question of the day all right so uh, let's see, what can I can I ask you? So um, ah, that's a, a good one. So um, when you have like a game night, do you prefer to play like um, several smaller games, or maybe you prefer to like having people over to say today we're gonna play this big game? I don't know, we're gonna play Cthulhu Wars for eight hours straight or something. Uh, or would you even uh, maybe play a filler game at the very beginning and then go into something more complex after that? What is your preference there? I think that when I have a game night, I find smaller games get, allow me to get people over more often. Also, personally, my tastes do tend towards variety. And so I do like playing. Frankly, I could play a whole night of fillers. Like sometimes you don't need bread. I could happily eat coronation chicken just on its own. 
But <laughs> um, by the same token, I could happily play, um, you know, One Night's Ultimate's Werewolf as like the main, this is why we are gathering. And it doesn't need to be, to my mind, a big epic multi-hour game to be the focus of the night. I would say that um, also at the end, it's a case of, hey, well, you're about to go, but let's drop in this little relatively low energy. If if it's late at night, then maybe not something that's speed-based, not something that's too creative, depending on how people are, um, but something that takes, you know, five, ten minutes, and then you can talk people into it. And then if they like it enough, then maybe they will stick around for another half hour or so. So I'm that kind of um, trying to keep people as long as they can and nice. trying to um, allow people to wander in. Um, Saint says, for a typical game night, we play one heavy game, which I assume means something that takes like two or three hours, one or two medium games, which knowing Saint, I'm assuming like 90 minutes, and fillers as fit while cooking to wind down. Let me know if my assumptions are completely off base, but that's a um, three hour game ish for the heavy game. Mm. So, yeah, there's a little bit of variety, and that sounds like a full game day, like a six, um, seven, eight hour, like, okay, we're going to spend a whole day together, which is absolutely lovely. I don't normally, outside of the Friday playtest, I don't normally get that opportunity, but I'd like to work more to make that happen. How about you, Fabrizio? Yeah, I I do um, almost the same as uh, our guest is uh, talking about now. I do like uh, normally one small game at the, at the beginning. Like normally it's Hyper Wars, to be honest. We just put it on the table, get everyone like uh, uh, the blood pumping, and then we go into something that is longer. Sometimes it's uh, like maybe a multi-hour game, like three or four hours uh, gameplay. And then most of people will leave. And then the ones that stay, then we play like smaller games or uh, not so long games, let's say one hour games or something like that, kind of medium sized games. Mm -hmm. Until well, everyone is uh, tired. <laughs> thank you for the question. And let me ask everyone else, over to you, what's up to you, you can share button if you want to. Today, I am going to focus on um, feeling vaguely useful. Um, I noticed that their sky, which was blue when I started, is now, I cannot see any blue at all. I can see tiny bits of white. I can see a lot of dark gray, but I think it's still relatively bright. So I'm going to go outside while it's not raining and go and see the docks. Other than that, um, I am going to take it easy, maybe entrench myself in reading a bit, and I might do a bit of writing. Um, there's some game-related stuff that I need to write out, basically some content. Um, I need to, I have been getting some help with the graphic design and pre-production, but then I need to be the one to kind of say, okay, this is exactly what's going on to each page, and this is all the text, and this is exactly how each page should be laid out. And then that person does it. And I don't want to discount what's being done because Chris has done lovely backgrounds from a game about drawing creatures complements to the drawings and complements to the complements. And Jack, who I'm now working with, has done beautiful, gorgeous backgrounds. That are, sorry, they're too far away for me to grab. And that was me ducking to see, can I grab one to show you? For a game about quickly grabbing cards and judging them against free descriptions. But I'm going to write out more things for the remaining three games that I will be finishing this year. And talking about how long a game takes to make, um, it's the, for me, I think it depends how much time you give it. <laughs> yeah. But is there anything that you want to share, Fabrizio? Yeah, I'm going to spend my next two days... Uh directly working on the campaign, finishing up either the video or preparing the messages I'm going to send my uh, my hopeful uh, back, backers, um, working on the social, social media aspect of it. And yeah, it's going to be all about Hyper Wars for the next 48 hours. Sounds awesome. And 
yeah, when it comes out, I'll definitely be letting people know because genuinely the only comparable things that I can think of are, okay, Dave Turksey's done a couple of things, um, Space Alert, um, Camelot by Tom Do Jolly. There's really not much. I mean, and so you're bringing new mechanisms and that card passing. And thanks for letting us know about that partial solar eclipse, Elaine. I mean, yeah, maybe that was why it is, because now I can, yeah, no, it, it's still pretty cloudy, not going to lie. It's just very cloudy here. <laughs> maybe it's the two things compounded. But to recap and wrap up before we finish up, I think we can all agree that, um, you know, everything in your life, even from your birth, is going to impact the stuff you make. But it's there's no point in saying that you've started making stuff until you've actively started working on it. And then when you finish, it depends on your goals. Now, if in the case of hype, we talked about brilliant things. We talked about taking a bit of time to relax and have a bit of tea time. We talked about, um, yeah, uh, making some of my games potentially a bit more strategic, like having vegetable nutrition and a lot of trolling from states, which is the best kind of trolling because it is done in a way to provoke interaction and amusement rather than to actually annoy, <laughs> which I do appreciate. Like if it was ever actually done to annoy, then I probably wouldn't, well, if it was ever, then I'd be like, okay, that's a bit off. But if it was always done to annoy, then I wouldn't be friends with Skate. But Skate is a lovely person. Let's just say that. And so is Elaine. And so are you, Fabrizio. Thank you for being here. We talked about Hyper Wars. Being in pr it's from 2018, but then not much has changed for the past like 18 months. So it sounds like it's basically from tw March 2018 to like... Um, 2021 the start of it so it was like that whole um like three and a little bit years and it sounds like a really interesting thing we decided that ultimately it does fall down on complexity your experience with that thing the possibility to play test the energy and also the goals how good does this thing need to be because my goals for a first edition Bessie bargain bag are not as high as my goals for a second edition or for something that I put into a talk box. If before I put it into a talk box, let alone something that I'm charging people $39 for, I want people to know that this is really bloody good. And so we did ask about what you generally tend to do at one of your typical gaming evenings. And obviously there's a variety of approaches and we talked about venturing outside, just making sure that, for, um, from my perspective, I'm going to try and make sure that I stay sane and don't fall into a pit of depression. And this has really helped. Thank you for coming on to my show, Fabrizio. And we talked about, um, yeah, doing the last minute Kickstarter stuff. So, yeah. um, it says, not being friends with Xate is scared. I mean, yeah, if I was a totally different person or you were a totally different person or our circumstances were different, then absolutely. But in this real world, um, I'm not making any threats. <laughs> that was not a threat at all. Um, but if you want to check me out, I am stuffed by bed in all of the places. Tomorrow, I um, Jess is unable to make it for personal reasons. And I will probably chat about one of my current games on Kickstarter, do a little bit of a designer diary. I'm curious as to which one people would be most interested in. Maybe I'll chat about the creatures in a game about cute comical creatures and trying to identify the monster to make noises. Like the four process is that went into the mouths and everything. But um, let me know if you would be more interested in one of the other ones. And then I'll have Fabrizio back on Thursday um, and, of course, if you want to check out Fabrizio generally, where would you like to be found? So uh, you can find our stuff uh, if you look in uh, most of the um, social media, Twitter, Facebook, 
Uh, Instagram, if you look for Dice Coalition Games, like the name of the company, uh, you're going to find our stuff there. Um, you can always, uh, of course, go to playhyperwars.com as well if you want to know more about the game. And you can even head out to our uh, main website or the Kickstarter project that uh, Beth has on the, the screen right now. And a lot of those links are also down there. So please do check all that stuff out and share, spread the word. And thank you very much, everyone. It has been an absolute delight. And the only thing, pardon me, left to say is, as always, bye, 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 bye. This is a goodbye song. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you for watching along. Bye, 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 bye. This is the end of the show. Bye, bye. Bye bye, and now it's time to go. Bye 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 bye. This is a goodbye song. Bye 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 bye. Thank you for watching along. Bye 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 bye. This is the end of the show. Bye 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 bye. And now it's time to go. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Bye bye.